Now I'd like to say a few words of introduction about our opening keynote uh, speaker of the day, Lieutenant General Clarence McKnight. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General Clarence McKnight is a retired U.S. Army general, former director, uh, Command, Control, and Communications of the U.S. Joint St Chief of Staff. Lieutenant McKnight headed both tactical and strategic communication commands before becoming deputy commandant and commandant of the Signal Training Center and commanding general of Fort Gordon in 1976. After 18 months, he became the first three-star commander of the Army Communications Command, Fort uh, Huachucha, with more than 33,000 soldiers and civilians spread throughout 14 countries. At Fort Gordon, he witnessed the merger of tactical and strategic communications. Also at the Signal Center, General McKnight was appalled to find many soldiers lacking mathematical and reading skills. The self-paced curriculum mandated uh, remedial study. His next assignment was Commander, 5th Signal Command in Europe, and Deputy Chief of Staff for Communications Electronics, U.S. Army Europe. Again, he witnessed the merging of tactical and strategic equipment, uh, S-I-N-C-G-A-R-S, uh, SINGARS, I think you'd say, uh, was the pipeline, and M-S-E was the source selection. He became the J-6 Director of Command, Control and Communications, in the Office of Joint Chief of Staff. The Army was moving uh, f toward the regimental system, and General McKnight strongly supported the concept, making the Signal Corps a single regiment. He was inducted in 1990 as a distinguished member of the Signal Regiment. Clarence McKnight graduated from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, class of 1952, and he officially retired in 1987 as the U.S. Army Lieutenant General. The topic that he's chosen this morning is Global Networks, Enablers for Soft and Smart Power. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Lieutenant General Clarence McKnight. Thank you. I'd like to make, of course, uh, as always, being a general, uh, you don't really have mic fright. You have a fear that you won't get a hold of the mic. So that means you want to be center of attention most of the time. But the higher I got in rank, the more humbling it is to become a general officer because you are where the buck stops. I want to talk to you a little bit about this enabler of soft and smart power. I have a book that's coming out. I'm not pushing on the book right now, but it won't be out till Christmas. But it's, uh, it's entitled, From Pigeons to Tweets. In the Korean War, thank you very much. He knows I'm going to run out of spit here pretty soon. Uh, in the Korean War in 1953 and 1954, I spent a lot of time on top of the mountains and in the hills, and uh, we had pigeons as backup communications, and I used to put little pieces of paper in their little feet and launch them, and away they'd go. And they'd bring up a new cage every day from the rear, and we'd put the pigeons up and go. On the 27th of July, 1953, a truce was signed. We had a ceasefire. I was in charge of most of the 45th Infantry Division's communications at that time, and I uh, used the pigeons to tell the regiments to cease fire. I also sent out motor messengers, scouts, and we used helicopters. All of these to say cease firing at 20 hundred hours, which was 8 o'clock at night. Now, there was a lot of reasons why they wanted to fire all that ammunition because they didn't want to carry it all the way back to the rear, so they wanted to shoot it up. So it was, uh, it was like the 4th of July, only it was the 27th of July, 1953. When I came back from uh, that particular war, I thought, Boy, that's, that's enough for me. I don't want this business anymore. And I was sent back to uh, Fort Monmouth. Fort Monmouth is a, a famous signal fort that's just now been closed last year. 
They bounced some signals off the moon. They had a lot to do with early telecommunications and so forth. But I learned an awful lot when I came back from Korea. I had been in West Point. I knew nothing really about communications. They didn't teach you that. They teach you how to shoot and how to blow up things. Not a whole lot about uh, high-level strategy and so forth because you're to be a platoon leader. You're to lead combat patrols. And if you will notice, I have quite a sunburn today because I was with the wounded warriors. I saw Tiger Wood just today, too. <laughs> Uh, there's a dark side to the war, and that's the wounded people. And so that's why I've tried so very hard to change the way we do business. I've been a, a general officer. I've been a director in public affairs in industry. I made a few dollars, and I put it all back into education. Because I think that that's a secret to the soft power, but you still have to have the, the smart power and the tough power if you want to survive in this world. Now, I carried a gun for a long number of years. I had bodyguards. I've been through just about every country that has any kind of armed force in the world. In 1961, I was alerted because the Chinese were getting frisky with the Indians. Has anybody ever heard of the mountain warfare that occurred in 1962? Most of you are too young to even think about that part of history, but the Chinese attacked India in 1962, the fall of 1962. They made two penetrations. They came down through Ley Ladakh and through the Northeast Frontier area. The United States has always been very compassionate and also very smart about diplomacy. We like to think we are. But as I said, the dark side is the wounded people that have to live with those wounds the rest of their life. And some of them that have PTSD, which is post-trauma from an explosion like an IED, an explosive device in Afghanistan and Iraq, they never really recover. They may push back the memories, but they never really recover. Some of these kids that I saw yesterday are in the prime of life, no legs, no arms. Uh, but uh, Tiger Woods was a big up swing for him. What I wanted to say about education, and I, that's uh, what Mark had said was, when I was the commandant, we had more and more complex things to teach the young people, and yet they were going downhill as far as the public education was concerned. You could hardly find anybody that could uh, go into a 42-week course on repairing a cryogenic filter on a six-story antenna, a satellite antenna. As I said, I have seen from pigeons to tweets, and I've worked with satellites. Uh, I had to go back to the well, the educational well at the University of Michigan, and really learn something about telecommunications. I went through a lot of the courses that the astronauts went through. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, talking to people about astronauts has too much meaning today, but it's still an exciting thing to think of researching in outer space. Also, when I was commandant, the biggest attraction during any kind of display were always the displays that NASA brought in. There's something exciting for young people about space. The Army has always been interested in space, and the U.S. Army Association perpetuates all the kinds of things the Army is interested in. This is a 
a manual I just got a week or so ago. It says, U.S. Army space capabilities enabling the force of decisive action. Well, as I, the title, <laughs> you enable both peace and war. And we use every, every means of communication from, we, did, we took the pigeons out though in 1957. <laughs> we, re we retired, that, that little line in the congressional budget was tough sometime to defend on pigeon feed. So they came out in uh, about 1957 and closed down. But I have seen around the world, um, anyone in here from south of the border and this hemisphere? <laughs> you habla espanol? <laughs> well, when I was in El Salvador, I was supposed to be the asesor de telecomunicaciones por la fuerza del Salvador. And that's supposed to be the advisor in telecommunications for El Salvador. I had an ID card which called me a commandante. And uh, it didn't take me but about 15 minutes to give them all I knew about radios at that particular time. <laughs> and they, they didn't really want to talk about radios. I said, Keke Eddie is dead. And they said, we want to learn to speak English. So you will find a lot of young people, now they're older, that have a Tennessee accent because I tried to teach them English. And that's, that's a, an element of soft power. That's, that's really getting next to people. Our ambassador had been a Supreme Court judge in Arizona. His name, by happenstance, was Raul Castro. He was really a wonderful guy. He later became the governor of Arizona. And that happened to be when I was chief of staff, and it's pronounced Mark Wachuca. <laughs> the, all the GIs used to call it, we got you. It's now the home of the intelligence uh, community. It's still headquarters for my old command, which is now called NETCOM. And uh, don't ask me about NETCOM because they destroyed what I built, I thought, was a wonderful enterprise. I had air traffic control. I had the whole, whole nine yards. In other words, I had the whole tamale. But uh, they broke it down into little pieces, and uh, the command still is a global command, but it doesn't have the strength or the tenacity when I put it together with the computer systems command and the communications command. There's an awful lot that people take for granted, just like our lights, our power, and everything else. And I'm sure that uh, Secretary, Chertoff uh, mentioned cyber. Does anybody have a hankering to talk about cyber? I'm sure you don't, <laughs> but <laughs> there, that is a big threat. Cyber is a big threat. You can shut down a power grid. And as you can tell, I don't know whether he mentioned, I missed part of his because of our wonderful transportation system here. I missed part of his lecture yesterday, but Estonia was shut down the government of Estonia was shut down. And now they have one of the better systems in, in the world as far as protecting their particular uh, systems. One of the things that most people take for granted or power, you know, where's the power, where's the air conditioning, where's this, where's that. And now we take for granted that any time you pick up a phone, you're gonna be able to talk to someone. Not necessarily so. There are a lot of people in this world who don't want you to talk, or if they want you to talk, they're gonna to listen to everything you say and take it down and repeat it back to you. And that's the infrastructure. And most people don't like to talk about infrastructure. It's very boring. It's the stuff that's in your basement. You know, it's where you really get your heat, you get your, all your connections come in, and if you have HD today, you wouldn't have anything if you didn't have all that stuff down there in your basement. And that's where your gas comes in too. And, and that's also for evil people to blow your house up. We are in a time frame right now where I agree with the gentleman from 
Africa that education is the most important thing that anybody could, could push. Most of our problems in this world are due to ignorance, poverty, greed, and corruption. And the only way we're going to get on top of that is to change the way that we educate our young people. This book is a small little book. I recommend it to any of you. A Brit wrote this, and he has a wonderful little video that talks about our current education systems, which was designed around the industrial base. And he said even the schools ring bells. They like a like a production line, they ring bells, change rooms, and do everything else in staccato. And they're just like Henry Ford still been to building Fords on an assembly line. And they said, well, why do, why do all kids have to be in school in the same grade at the same age? Because you don't learn necessarily at the same grade level. When I was the commandant, uh, I was assistant commandant first when I got into business of watching self-paced. Self-paced is a misnomer unless you have young people that can read and comprehend. It just doesn't work that way. I would watch young people just turn pages and turn pages and I'd say, son, can you read? Well, some, sir, but I, I, I can't understand what they're saying here. So self-paced is wonderful if you can read and comprehend, but it's a waste of time if you can't. And we have forced a lot of young people through systems before they know how to, to read and rationalize. I guess you probably know my bottom line on tweets. I think we should do less tweeting and more critical thinking. Uh, when I was in the Vietnam War, I had three different battalions. I had two in combat and one in Europe, and the one in Europe was as bad as the ones over <laughs> in the other, other locations. Uh, we had brought in an awful lot of young people with the draft, and I had a boss and a mentor who was big general, and he used to tell the commanding general, General Abrams in Vietnam, he said, uh, We've got to keep the, the shooters talking. And uh, his boss says, no, that's not right, Tom. We need to shoot the talkers. And that's the way you keep secrets. You don't <laughs> blab. You don't put out an awful lot of information that you don't necessarily need. Now, I hope I don't live in isolation. I have four grandchildren. One is in the FBI. One is a bomb tech in the Tucson Police Department. One is a kind of a actuarial, and the other one is a freelance artist. <laughs> so I, I get the whole spectrum. And uh, the little gal that carries a Glock delivered my first great-grandchild in December. So I stay in touch with them, but I, I stay off of the Facebook as much as possible. Uh, it, it really, uh, you have an awful lot of information. Having more clearances than the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, I had to be debriefed so often that all the compartment and information I have keeps me awake at night. And you wonder why we have so much classified information. I was always on a kick about trying to reduce the amount of classified information. And if you will remember, recently we have all of the, the leaks about uh, from the White House. No, it's not from the White House. No, it's not here. And uh, people are always curious about what's happening. And Washington is a favorite place to start a rumor. You can start one here faster than you can start a dry fire out in Colorado. I stayed away from Washington 32 out of the 35 years, and they finally trapped me in here my last three years, and I haven't left because I'm still trying to solve some of these problems. But, but uh, it's a wonderful place to be, but it's, it's truly Disneyland East.
and I mean that more than, than one, because we have converted an awful lot of our young people into clerk typists. My boss years ago was named Gigi Grombacher, and Gigi was in World War II. He was an intelligence uh, analyst. Uh, he won the Silver Star. He was a very brave man. Uh, he was born in Germany, and you know, he uh, naturally spoke very fluent. And one day he came in, I was his chief of staff, and he said, Mac, we are creating regiments, regiments of clerks. You know, in the old days, the general carried a writing crop because he wasn't supposed to get his hands into anything and get everybody all mixed up about things. And you know, they would walk around and even Patton would slap his riding crop on his leg and get your attention. Those generals have gone. The ones today carry blackberries. Uh, they have more communications. In fact, TMI. Anybody know what TMI means? Too much information. <laughs> I got that from my granddaughter. <laughs> She says, you never give too much information. You're so tight, you don't let anybody know what's going on. I said, well, that's part of the way I grew up. Uh, but on topic, enablers of soft power are infrastructure, are cell phones. Is anybody can tell me who's got the largest Wi-Fi network in the world? Pakistan. <laughs> you know, they don't have a lot of wire in the grounds over there. See, I know all this trivia because my wife is, a, is pretty well crippled up, and so I have to sit in on all of the Jeopardy and all the other quizzes of, of trivia. But one of the things, how many people live in this area? Anybody? Okay, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Do you know who Fort Myers named after? No. <laughs> See, most people know Fort Myers. Fort Myers named after Albert J. Meyer, who was a doctor. And he was the first chief signal officer for Abraham Lincoln. And uh, his, he's not buried there, but uh, he has a big sort of, it looks like a, a crypt, but it's not. It's a, it's a tribute to Albert J. Meyer, and it says, founder of the U.S. Army Signal Corps and the U.S. Weather Service. Now, I never tried to dabble in that weather side of the Signal Corps, even though I was a senior officer my last four years, because I think only God can predict the weather, not Al Gore. Uh, we're, we're, in for, we're in for a change, I'm sure, along the line. That's one thing I always tell young generals. If you don't have a sense of humor, forget it, because you're going to need it awfully bad down the line. Uh, I spent 35 years on active duty. Then after that, 20, I've been 25 years consulting, making more money than I'm, I'm really supposed to make. But I talked to Colin Powell one day, and Colin was a two-star general when I was a three-star general. He was Gen uh, Secretary Weinberger's military assistant. And naturally, Colin has become extremely famous and so forth. I wish he had, had run for president because he, he's a very solid thinker. Um, he looks for logic, and he's, he's a tremendous role model for young people. And he agrees with me that education is where it really starts. I have another education warrior on my side, and that's Jim Kimsey, the founder of AOL. Jim and I share a, an honor by being on the parade ground in 2008 as distinguished graduates of West Point. Jim for founding AOL and me for surviving as long as I did as a signal officer. <laughs> I'm the I'm the only signal officer that came out of West Point. They don't have a single general officer from West Point anymore. I, I closed the door, I guess. 
but uh, they were very kind, and, and Jim is a superb uh, supporter of education. He tries very hard to support the charter schools, and he's from the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and he's, he's a tough warrior. He's an infantry officer. He and I served on the bicentennial for West Point for eight years. Most people don't know that West Point is 200 years old in 2002. It was uh, actually recommended by George Washington, and it was founded by Jefferson. And the class of 2002 has been part of that Wounded Warrior Corps. And the times have changed. When I was at West Point, there were no women at West Point. Uh, there was no don't ask, don't tell kind of stuff either. But that's changed. Uh, we are changing as a society. Uh, you look around Washington, you go to any relatively large city in this country and you will see what one young lady that interviewed me one time said, you see the hues of the human race everywhere. And I said, that's true. You know, everywhere the GIs go, they bring home brides. And that's another, we have our immigrants and we have our, our young brides that come home. And I have been a member at the Fort Myer Chapel <laughs> since 1984. And it is wonderful to see the second and third generations of young people. And they come from around the world, Thai, Korean, from Africa, Norway. The military serves wherever they send them. They don't uh, go select. I put on my preference statement Hawaii every year. Never got there. <laughs> Only R&R. &R. But we have a democracy here which is messy. There's no question about it. But we do change every so often, and we try again. But I've never felt uneasy in the military. I always look to the civilian leadership, and if they screw up, they screw up. But I'm not going to screw up. My heart is in my business, and I think that America needs to turn around and look at the right priorities. The right priorities today are education. And uh, I've got some solutions. If you want to talk about cyber, read Carafano's Wiki Wars. And uh, it's, it's interesting if you're in the technology business to, to look at, at these kinds of books. Uh, my friend John Grimes was the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Network Integration. Uh, he did such a marvelous job like me, they did away with the job. <laughs> when they can't understand something, they do away with it. That's the, that's the essence of the way our government works. Uh, the only thing that they haven't done away with, uh, you know, that they created, I'll bet you that most people don't know why the Department of Energy was created. It was created to make us energy independent. We ain't got there yet. <laughs> we got a long way to go. But being in this, she got my five minutes up there. <laughs> the old man talks, he rambles on, don't let him talk too long. But I wanted to tell you that in my 35 years, I spent 16 overseas, and I did a lot of that in what I call soft power. There was a very small mission in India when I went over there and I traveled all over up into the mountains of the Himalayas and uh, I saw what looked to me like the turn back of two or three centuries when I watched uh, the people spinning on their spinning wheels and herding their yaks up in the northern areas and then I visited places like Tezpur where they flew the hump in World War II America has been everywhere as long as it's existed. And Colin Powell aptly said, 
we don't ask for any territory except to bury our, our young and our dead. And we are not an expansionist, even though we bought the Louisiana Purchase and we bought Alaska from Russia. I mean, <laughs> we got enough space. <laughs> we just need to have smart people, that's all. And we need, to, we need to reverse this thing. We have the best universities in the world. We have 80 out of the top 100 universities in this country. We have a lot to be proud of as Americans. But if you don't take that, that knowledge and bring it up from the bottom, it's going to die off. We're not going to have it. Uh, right now, we really have to depend on smart immigrants and visas and so forth. We need to teach people how to do things. My father could do anything. He, he didn't have but 11th grade education, but he was born on a farm. He knew how to fix anything. Well, he said, son, you're a good tool holder. <laughs> so I made, I made a system. I made a, a choice. I don't want to be a cotton picker, and I don't want to be out here on a farm anywhere. But it has been my privilege to serve the nation for over 50 years, both in active duty and in service to other people and not-for-profit organizations. I've been the chairman of the Community Learning and Information Network, which helped spawn the distance learning sites for the National Guard all over the country. And we are very, very proud of our soldiers. Uh, the National Guard now has partnerships with what used to be the Eastern Bloc countries. And by the way, I mentioned Estonia as, as a cyber uh, victim. Maryland is the partner for Estonia. So ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to a question or two if you'd like. Uh, I think I can hit most of the areas of the world. Um, I had a global command 33,000 people in 1,400 facilities, and I had the responsibility for air traffic control communications. So uh, with that, I will stop and see if, do we have time for any questions? We do. Okay. First of all, let's express our gratitude. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, we do have time for questions, so I'd ask, as always, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> you never miss a chance to sit down. It's working? Yes? Okay. Excellent. So first of all, thank you very, very much again, uh, Lieutenant McKnight. We would now like to take some questions and comments. So as always, if you could briefly introduce yourself when posing the question, that would be helpful for us. And I think, Stan, it looks like we have three three cameras today, so we're uh, video recording everything. And I think we'll have uh, some Japanese TV joining us for the Ambassador of Japan uh, in a few moments. But first of all, please, your questions or comments for the Lieutenant. Who would like to go first? Yes, please. Sherry Mueller, President Emeritus of the National Council for International Visitors, thank you so much for your presentation. Wanted to ask you, you gave us some good reading lists. I've just finished the book Drift by Rachel Maddow about the increasing militarization and how do you feel about the fact that the escalating military budgets, it's very hard for those of us fighting for Fulbright programs and international exchange um, to dent our uh, members of Congress and advocate for the educational, international educational programs. And I wondered what you thought was the best argument to use with some of our members of Congress to help them understand we need to spend money on this kind of thing as well. well that's, a, that's a good question. I don't know, am I on here? You can probably hear me as well. Um, I get emotional when I talk to these young people that have war wounds and so forth, and I'm not a pacifist, but there are really an awful lot of ways that we could economize. Uh, we've got young people now that represent less than 1% of the nation. Where you have the big expenditures are in the big weapon systems and in telecommunication in my field. Um, this book I told you that I'm putting out as a Christmas gift for my family. <laughs> I said I'll sell at least five copies of it. 
I talk about the stimulation of the military industrial complex. And I, through 50 years of association as a consultant and so forth, I got a good insight into why this exists because there are so many people employed now in the defense business that to cut back, they're now having paranoia about the sequester. They really are. Now, a good common sense person can run a professional military with a lot less hardware than we're doing today. As I mentioned, we created regiments of people that want more and more information. And when you have all this more and more information, the TMI kicks in and you got too much information and you don't, don't know what to do with it. We have spent billions of dollars in fighting to preserve things that we don't need to preserve. They just uh, delivered something like 700 pallets of uh, a scientist who was a astronomer, Sagan, to the archives here. Well, you know, I shipped out seven boxes out of my office when I left because I was bringing all the mementos in, and I, so I just shipped them to a museum somewhere. We, we seem to be keepers of things we don't really need. Uh, and our motor pools are full of trucks. You know, now it costs $300,000 for an up-armored vehicle that can get blown up by a $5 IED. I mean, let's get serious about how we're spending this money. And I mentioned that, that I believe, I've worked for both the Democrats and the Republicans. I worked for Sam Nunn when I was commanding down in, I say that, because they really do. They control everything you do. They control your budget. They control everything. Congress has, has got you nailed to the wall. If you're sitting there like a marionette and not cooperating with them, you're out of business. Sam's a good golfer also. That doesn't hurt. Uh, I worked for Goldwater, Senator Goldwater, when I commanded Fort Huachuca. And they would listen to me. Uh, I'd say, we don't need to do this. We don't need to put that. And there are internal arguments. You have to, you have to go on record with a congressman and say, no, that don't, we don't need that. But it always in involves jobs. I was the biggest employer in southern Arizona at Fort Huachuca because I had the AEG, the Army Proving Ground, and I had the Intelligence Center there when I was the installation commander. And you, you cut back, you do a BRAC, and people get nervous. They start dancing on the ceiling. Oh, can't close Fort Gordon. Can't cl yes, you can close just about everything you want to close if you want to. Fort Ord, they closed Fort Ord, and it's, it's now an a extension of, of uh, University of California. A uh, room without, a uh, classroom without walls. I'm very passionate about education, don't get me wrong. I know how to shoot, too. It's very important. You get smart people. You, get, you need to have fewer people just milling around, because you, I've had that happen in peacetime, in a peacetime army. You don't want to have more people on, on duty than you can have. They'll be painting rocks, and they'll be cutting grass, they'll be doing all this other stuff. I was hauled up before the IG one time. You had, you had your GIs cutting grass when you had a contractor. Right. The grass grows in between the time and the contractor. Plus, I'm not going to let them just hang out in the barracks. I'm going to keep them busy until the next class starts. You can't always start a class just because you got enough people pouring in for that particular class. You had overlap sometimes. Management is very important. And you know, uh, I'd be the first to tell you that they have as many general officers today for half the forces that we had. They got more of them now. Does that mean it takes more generals to run 
run more people? I don't know. I was lucky to ever get past uh, the glass ceiling. Any other questions? Hi, uh, I'm Thomas Cotter. I'm a student at Old Dominion University. First of all, thank you for coming, sir. Can you hear me? Uh, what university? Old Dominion University in Norfolk. Uh, you spoke multiple times of the importance of education. So I was wondering if you could uh, tell us about the GI Bill's influence on cultural diplomacy and the importance of having educated military personnel abroad. I think it's very important, and I think the GI Bill, I was a benefit of the GI Bill from World War II. Not that I was in World War II, I was 16 when it ended. But I went to the University of Tennessee, and just about everybody in my fraternity, it was a reestablished uh, fraternity, were ex-GIs. They, they had the GI Bill. I got to use their books. I didn't have to buy books. and. They were very mature. Most of the young people coming back now that have been shot at, you can believe that they are very mature people. I talked to some Navy SEALs yesterday. One had no arm, one had no leg. Courageous people, conscientious, want to do something good. One of them was a, I, I could talk to him because he, he was a demolition expert and my grandson he blow up anything. I mean, he's got a moon suit and he can go in anywhere. And uh, any time that the president comes out in that part of the world, he's in the convoy. These young people are very conscientious. Once they see death up close, and the GI Bill, you can't do enough for them. Now, there's a whole industry out there that's trying to, to sap the government with bum material. The content is the important part. I had some other stuff I was going to talk to you about, the, the evolution of information, and I wanted to talk about Peter Drucker and so forth, because he predicted, you know, that a lot of this information will go away on the technology, but what will remain here will be the content. And in this not-for-profit that I have been pushing on for 20 years, I said, quit, get off of the technology. Get on to the content, because the content is the mana of education. And if you don't know how to impart that, we have a, a school that I've been kind of looking at very closely out in California. It's modeled really on the, the one-room school where you have peers and mentors. The first grade mentors the kindergarten. The second and third grade are together. The fourth grade is sabbatical. Fifth and sixth are together. Seventh and eighth are together. But there's, there's not anybody rattling around without a mentor and a helper. And it's not uh, what Ken Robinson says. You know, they say that uh, Teaching to the test is bad. The way that the military used to drill people, but the way I drilled people was giving them tests to see if they knew how to take a radio apart or how to put it back together. Did it work after they put it back together? Those are those are true tests. Now, those some of those are in the area of vocational training and it, that you don't don't need. And I'm not against the liberal arts. I think they're very important. I was at uh, at West Point, I was in the art club because I like to draw. But I also like to go to New York and see all the models, too. I always had a scheme, you know, if you're, you're going to be in something, get something out of it. The GI Bill is very important, and they can't spend enough money as far as I'm concerned. I'd rather not build a carrier or uh, an up-ended uh, Humvee I canceled some programs when I was a director of J6. Uh, the Defense Science Board would bring them in in a wheelbarrow every every time. Oh, we got to have this. Oh, we got to have that. So when I was a consultant and they were paying me a lot more, I was even killing more out there because even in those days, everything is designed 
to keep the industrial base perpetuated. And that's not all bad because we actually have a business selling that stuff to our allies. But the, uh, the education is, is where we should be focused right now. And we're, we're not doing it right as far as I'm concerned. Well, I have to come down hard on WikiLeaks. Um, I was in charge of cryptographic uh, sections all over the world, and uh, I was against the release of information on uh, the Pentagon Papers. Uh, there's something that can be done uh, by giving good briefings without giving away the crown jewels, and WikiLeaks You can't change the world, you know, you've got to speak truth to power, but uh, you can't be a whistleblower inside of the, the security arena. Uh, I mentioned John Grimes, I don't know, do you know John? John and I worked together for years and years and years, and he's a speaker on the cyber end of it right now. And I, I would recommend that you, you read this book by Carafano, which is called Wiki at War. Uh, John is at the Heritage Foundation. There's other people working at uh, Brookings and AFSIA that are very interested in uh, trying to tie it, uh, the tail on the donkey as far as cyber is concerned. WikiLeaks, um, bad news as far as I'm concerned where PFC can put a flash drive in and <laughs> run off with the with the, the secret sauce um, I've been in federal court for four years already uh, on uh, impinging on intellectual property and I'm still chasing a dinosaur uh, it's very difficult to uh, to defend patents and the technology. Nobody understands this stuff. I used to sit in the tank with three, four star generals and admirals and their eyes would glaze over. You know, and I try to <laughs> I try to put this into Dick Jane charts and so forth to explain all this stuff flying around out there twenty two thousand five hundred miles in space. And then uh, you have these smoke blowers come in and say, Oh, we gotta have GPS. I said what orbit does GPS fly in? What is, the, what is the orbit? What's the altitude? How many are in the constellation of GPS? How often do they have to be refreshed? Nobody understands this stuff, you know. Talk to John Grimes. He'll tell you about going to Sicily and talking to scientists that are trying to, to defang the nuclear weapons. And their, their idea is use, it, use, nu use nuclear power, but use it for useful purposes, not to blow up the world. The first thing that I had, and I, when I gave a, a speech as a potted plant replacement for the chairman occasionally, I had his speechwriter give me all the words, you know, the first, first element of military strategy was nuclear deterrence. Then came control of the seas, control of the use of space, blah, 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 you know. All of those, you have the industrial base sitting outside the door ready to, to put this, oh, this will work over there, this will do over there, and so forth. And I, I found out there were an awful lot of people that I call acronym managers. They knew what that acronym meant, but they didn't know anything behind there. I went to, I'm a lifelong learner, I opened that cage every day and I look at the Wizard of Oz back there beating on a pan. Because he's there and don't you believe he's not. 
Thank you for your attention. I know I'm getting close here. Appreciate it very much. God bless you all. We can once again express our gratitude to Lieutenant General uh, McKnight. Thank you very, very much, Lieutenant McKnight. It was an honor to have you back at the ICD. You're, I think, uh, definitely part of the ICD family at this point. So it's, uh, it was great, great to have you back. I'll just shake your hand and then give a brief introduction for the Ambassador of Japan. Thank you very much.